Good evening. I'm calling this meeting of the Germantown Board of Education to order at 7.01 p.m. and I ask that you join me in standing if you're able to say the Pledge of Allegiance and for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Official meeting notification, Mr. Stausel. Yes, public notice of all meetings has been given by communication from the superintendent's office to the public, to those news media who have requested such notices, and to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Northwest Now, Express News, and West Bend Daily News. Public notice has also been posted in the schools throughout the district on the gsdwi.org website, as well as cable access channel 96. Thank you. Uh, roll call, Mr. Barney. Satterberg. Here. Medved. Here. Loth. Here. Borden. Here. I'm here. Reineman. Here. Larson. Here. Okay, item number two, approval of the agenda. Move to approve the agenda. Second. Discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. <coughs> Moving on to item three, citizen comments. We have three folks signed up. Will Joletta Kirpin please come forward? Good evening and welcome. I'm glad to be here before Scott. Um, so, <laughs> side note, I know the K kids are going to talk in a little bit, and I just wanted to say, Mr. Krieger is an amazing asset to the K kids, to the Kiwanis Back Club, so I just want to give him a little shout out. Um, my name is Jaletta Kirkman. Thank you for the opportunity for me to speak tonight. Uh, my daughter Jacqueline is a seventh grader at Kennedy Middle School and a graduate of Amy Bell. Uh, the other day I mentioned her, and I know it's not on the agenda tonight, um, the possibility of the middle school and the high school riding the bus together next year. She, was, she had very strong feelings, especially worried about the younger kids. Um, I told her she has an outlet to tell people about her feelings, and she chose, instead of standing up here, to email the board. Um, but something tells me at some point she will be up here before she graduates. Uh, she emailed the board Sunday. We received one response. Thank you from the transportation chair, Mr. Borden. And I think just as parents, we want our kids to be heard. Um, so I'm very proud of her in making this effort, and I just wanted to read it in case you didn't get to see it. Uh, again, seventh grade kid writing this. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Kirpin. I am a seventh grader at Kennedy Middle School. I've been riding the bus since kindergarten every day to Amy Bell and now Kennedy Middle School. I ride the bus currently from 6.45 to 7.30 in the morning, every day for 45 minutes, and for 30 minutes on the afternoon bus. It's a total of one hour and 15 minutes a day. Sorry. <laughs> Recently I heard that the school district board was considering combining the middle school and high school buses. I am not particularly fond of this. I'd like you to keep some things in mind. First, the buses would most likely have many sixth graders, and at least probably a few 11th and 12th graders. That range, age range is between 11 and 18 years of age. Hence, we're fourth, not even a teenager to an adult riding the bus. Secondly, for myself, personally, I would not be sure how comfortable I would be with kids several years older than me. When I think about the conversations I would have as a 12-year-old versus a 16-year-old conversation, it's a huge difference. Thirdly, combining these age groups would make a bus driver's job even harder. Riding the bus could be a difficult thing for some kids. When you were younger, did you ever not want to be on the bus, even with kids your own age? I have felt that way. Being a sixth grader or a new kid at a new school is tough enough. But to be on the bus with kids who are way older can be stressful. Also, if I was an older kid, a junior or senior, I wouldn't like the idea of riding the bus with the younger kids. Thank you for taking the time to read this email, and have a good day. Jacqueline Kirpin, seventh grade at Kennedy Middle School. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott Heffley. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Uh, my comments aren't on transportation. So uh, just a couple things. Um, I feel like I always come up with negative things to say, not always, but tonight I have something good to add and a couple things I'm concerned about. Um, I know the last meeting I wasn't able to make it, but I did watch it online because I do that. And um, I am concerned about, you know, I know we're trying to find ways to fill the budget or fix the budget or whatever it is. 
And this, this e-school idea with Kiel was a total shock for me. It wasn't on the agenda, didn't know anything about it, but I know work was done on it, and apparently a lot of work looking into that. So I look around, because I'm a curious person, and I see that they've had it for a long time, but there's only a few kids in it. I mean, that's fine. But we're talking about a school district whose measurables are far, far, far below ours, okay? If we believe niche.com or any school digger, any places that rank schools, I mean, Germantown, we're 16th in the state. You know, that's pretty high, right? I won't mention where Kiel is, but it's very far below it. And the measurables are way below ours. So, I don't know why we would do that. Now, disclaimer, my youngest graduated this past year from Germantown, but I had two kids go through the school district. I can assure you, if this idea was presented to me when they're in school, I would not be in favor of it. Why would I want my kid to get education from a school district that's nowhere near ours as far as measurable proficiency? I would not want that. So I say we wait and see what, what the plan was all along. <clears throat> if we get those grants we're talking about and we look into doing it ourselves, let's do it ourselves and do it right. I don't think a stock get measure does anything but confuse parents. And I don't want to do that. And I'm sure you guys don't want to do that either. So that's my point in that. The 4K idea, I heard that talked about during this election cycle. Um, I moved here in 1993. Okay, that's almost 30 years ago. They were talking about 4K back then. And I know that's before any of you were on the board. But somebody like Sarah has been in the community longer than me. They were talking about it in 93. They were talking about it in 98. They were talking about it in 2005. We are literally one of the only districts to not have it. So I don't know why it takes 30 years to come up with a 4K program when everybody else has it and they seem to be, it's a revenue generator. It really is. So I think seriously we got to look into that. And I know there's talk about it, we will, but I think that's a tremendous idea. I mean, Push it forward, if you can. I mean, I think we have the space, we've improved the schools. Let's find a way to do a 4K. Let's bring some money into the district. That's my idea. So the last two things. First one is um, we talk about, you know, I know transparency, communication, fiscal conservancy, these are recurring themes. I like to throw another one out there, accountability, okay? If you like crazy acronyms like me, here's an acronym called FACT. Fiscally conservative, accountable, communicate, and transparent. That's fact. So accountability is easy to say who's accountable, who's not accountable. But accountability, you wonder who, who's accountable. Now, you can say that the board is accountable to the taxpayers. I agree with you, right? We voted you on. So when we say we got to fix the budget and we're going to make the district accountable, well, the question is, who are you accountable to? I guess us, but that accountability has to go all the way down and all the way up. We all have to be accountable for what we're doing on a board, in our lives, work, whatever. Accountability is important. Everybody likes to pass the buck, it's the way of the world, but accountability is important. And the final thing I'll say, I know two of you were missing last meeting, but I did make a statement. I said, <clears throat> and I see it in the papers, we have to quit blaming, blaming the pandemic for the budget problems, okay? We had budget problems before the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated it, but we had problems before the pandemic. It didn't cause the problems. It did not. I feel, in the work research I've done, that we overpowered, spent down our fund balance, and that's where we are. And now we're talking about selling off one time, part time, you know, assets that are paid off and doing other things. You know, it's in your hands, but I feel like I have to say something. And so I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adam Johnson. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Johnson. Uh, I'm a social studies teacher at GHS and a member of the GEA Executive Board. Uh, a few weeks ago, I requested that the GEA seek more relationship building opportunities with the school board. Considering that we already have a GEA member attending all the school board meetings, uh, I recommended that we share some brief thoughts during the comments section on a more regular basis. Uh, it's my hope that these opportunities will increase the rapport between the GEA and the school board as we collectively strive for the best teaching, learning, and leadership opportunities for our students, staff, and school board, and the community. Uh, with that in mind, there are two areas we wish to share thoughts on just briefly. First, 
I'd like to mention the success of the catch-all days being used at the middle school and the high school. Uh, while some members of the community may not understand the purpose or the value of these, uh, each one has, I believe, helped staff successfully build relationships with the students who are virtual. Uh, we've had increased opportunities for communication with parents and guardians. It gives us uh, additional help for struggling students by refocusing their attention uh, and helping them build a plan for success without waiting until the end of the grading period. And while we may never be able to eliminate every DRF in the district, it is, in this unusual academic year, uh, a great benefit to have these catch-all days. Uh, we thank the administrators' efforts for arranging this schedule, and we thank the administration and the board for providing for their continued use. Uh, second, the GA would also like to share the support for the creation of the Advocacy Council on Equity. We think this is an, ass an essential step towards creating a school district that reflects the cultures of all students. Dismissive comments that have been shared on social media and during conferences only further emphasize the need for this group to help drive our future curricular decision making. Understanding that the possibility that some teachers may face backlash from parents, guardians, and members of the community as we evolve our curriculum to be more inclusive, we hope that you will consider the involvement <coughs> of the GEA at the council meetings to observe and to share insight into the current efforts taking place in the classroom. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope the GEA and the school board can continue these brief opportunities for communication on future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, and I think uh, what you're doing is great. So keep it up. Appreciate that. Would anybody else like to speak tonight? Okay. Moving on to item four, approval of the March 22nd, 2021 Board of Education, March 22nd, 2021 closed session, and April 7, 2021 closed session minutes. Entertain a motion. Move to approve the March 22nd board and closed session minutes, as well as the April 7th closed session minutes. Second. Discussion. No discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Moving on to item five, reports and information items. Amy Bell School Report. Mr. Stausen. Yes, we're going to have uh, Mr. Krieger's going to bring in some of the Amy Bell students, and they're, they have a short presentation for you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you here to uh, Amy Bell School. Um, tonight we're going to be sharing some things with you in regards to K-Kids. Uh, for those people that do not know who I am, I'm uh, Mr. Krieger. I've been actually a part of Germantown School District for quite some time, actually. Probably oh, uh, more than some of you have been around. <laughs> um, I started as a student uh, way back when, so I've been around for about 57 years. So, uh, But I've been teaching for Germantown in different capacities for uh, 39 years. And uh, one of the things that I took on about 25 years ago with one of my former principals was uh, the K-Kids. And tonight, we thought we'd share some of the things that the K-Kids uh, are involved in here at Amy Bell. And so we brought along the officers. And before they ran for office, I told that, that, them that somewhere along the line, they might have to do some public speaking. Mm -hmm. They're used to talking to the kids. They're used to uh, making announcements. But they've never had to go in front of adults and talk. So this is a wonderful experience for them just because we're trying to build leadership skills. And this is one of the great leadership skills that they can work on. So uh, one of the reasons why I've been involved with uh, K-Kids for so many years is because, you know what, within this building and the walls, there's a lot of things that go on. A lot of teaching goes on. But also, there needs to be a lot of other things that go along with that. And one of those things is learning how to communicate, how to do uh, service uh, to our community, and then also building those leadership skills. So tonight, I brought the four officers, and they're going to share with you what we, are, we have been doing uh, at Amy Bell as K-Kids. So we're going to start off with our first young man, Hooper, if you'd like to come up. Good 
Hi. Oh, hi. My name is Cooper Jansen, and I am the current president of K Amy Bell K Kids. K Kids is an elementary school leadership group under the sponsorship of Kiwanis and our Germantown community. K Kids is a student led community service organization that is made up of fifth graders. Any fifth grader can apply to be part of K Kids. When applying, each student needs to fill out an application answering questions about leadership. Once students apply and are accepted to be a K-Kid, they participate in group activities that, that, that develop a positive self-esteem and listening and speaking skills. K-Kids also helps to develop respect for school, community, and our country. This year, we have tw over 20 members in our K-Kids. Each member can run to be an officer. We have an election to decide who will be president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. As an officer, we run our weekly meetings. K-Kids meet during our recess, so we have to give up our recess time to or organize activities. As a group, we brainstorm ideas that we want to do to benefit our, communi our community and school. We vote on our ideas, then plan our events for the year. We try to plan one main activity each month. We would like to share the different activities that we've been doing w this year with you. Hi, my name is Luke Schrader. I am the secretary of K-Kids. After we have decided on the activities that we are going to do, the real work begins. The K-Kids decide how to promote the project. Many times, we create posters that hang around the school explaining our project. Then, we share the project with the students by doing announcements or by going to each classroom to do a speech that shares the importance of our project. We design containers to collect the items we are asking the students to bring. As the, as the items come in, we collect them, organize them, and prepare them for delivery. Lastly, we share with the students their success in getting involved in the project. One of the activities we did this year was a toy drive. The drive was called Kids to Kids Toy Drive. We worked with Capco Corporation. Students donated new toys that were given to families in southeastern Wisconsin through the Salvation Army and two dozen other non-profit organizations. Our Kids to Kids Toy Drive helped teach students the value of giving. We collected almost 200 new toys to give to families in need. Wow, that's, that's great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amelia Slots. I'm the Vice President of the Amyville K-Kids. We organized a spirit week for Amyville students to participate in. We organized it during Dr. Seuss Read Across America Week so that learning and reading and learning could be involved. The K-Kids decided what fun days would happen all week long. We did Miss Bash, Crazy Hair Day, Dress Alike, Amyville Wear Day, Google Meet Day, where students were and staff wore formal clothes on top and, and pajamas on the bottom. <laughs> Class Choice Day and Dr. Seuss Day, a committee of K-Kids, were able to judge Class Choice Day, deciding which classes were mo the most creative. My name is Haley Sadowski and I'm the treasurer of K-Kids. The K-Kids decided to help the Germantown Recreation Department by filling Easter eggs for the annual, annual Germantown Easter Egg Hunt. We <coughs> felt filling, filling Easter eggs benefits the Germantown community and would bring joy to kids in the Germantown. We had to separate the eggs by color, then fill the eggs with candy. We donated some of the candy. We filled three large bins or, over, or probably almost 2,000 eggs. <laughs> the K-Kids decided that donating food to those in need was very important. What better way to get students involved than coordinating a food drive with the Super Bowl? What involved in coordinating a food drive with the Super Bowl? We organized the Super Bowl challenge with students donating cans of soup. It was super. 
For each can donated, the student could vote on the team that they thought that what would win the Super Bowl. We collected over 300 cans of soup. The soup went to the local food pantry in the Ronald McDonald House where families can stay when their child is at Children's Hospital. Our big fundraiser for this year is a money collection drive. This year we will, we will be do doing a coin drive called Coins for Kids. Each class will have their own job to collect their coins. We will collect the money each week and let the school know how well Amy Bell is doing. In past years, we have collected close to $2,000 in coins. This year, we will be donating to two organizations. They are called You Are the Hero, which is a local nonprofit org which is a local nonprofit organization that works with terminally ill children. You Are the Hero interviews the terminally ill children about what types of heroes they want to be. Then designs a comic book with the child as the main character. The second organization the K Kids will be donating to is the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. We will be setting a goal for the students and have a fun reward for reaching that goal. This month, the K-Kids is making kindness a priority. We are running a donation drive to make kindness bags. The kindness bags will include personal care products. Each grade level will donate a specific necessity. Items being collected are toothbrushes, bars of soap, deodorant, toothpaste, shampoo, conditioner, and hand sanitizer. We will collect the donations and make kindness bags. Donating the kindness, the bags to the local food pantry. We will emphasize that together we can make a difference. <laughs> the last project the K-Kids will do is in June. Is collecting used markers. We will be asking students to donate their old used markers to be recycled. The Crayola Color Cycle program takes old markers and turns them into wax compound. This wax compound can be used for asphalt to build roads, roof shingles to build houses, and to make electricity that can be used to heat homes, cook food, and power vehicles. Not only can markers be donated, but dry erase markers and highlighters. We'll be using recycled coffee cans to make collection containers. What a great way to help Mother Earth. So from the projects and activities we presented tonight, you, you can see we have tried to do things that make a difference in our community, our school, and the world. We appreciate the support of all the Amiibo families who made our service projects a success. The K-Kids are thankful for, to the Germantown Kiwanis to, for their support, as well our goal to make a difference in, our, in the lives of others. Thank you for giving us the time to share our activities with you tonight. <laughs> Well, don't go away yet. <laughs> Kids, you did a wonderful job. Uh, I knew about uh, K-Kids, but I learned more about K-Kids tonight. And making a difference in our community, that's an understatement. Uh, together we can make a difference. I think you kids are rock stars. Uh, you're awesome. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, wonderful work that you're doing. Colleagues? Yes, I thought all of you are on your way to being great public speakers. Your presentation, you all had wonderful eye contact. You worked well together as a team. I, uh, I wondered what else you were gonna pull off the cart. It was like <laughs> the rabbit pulling stuff out of their hat. And uh, most importantly, the skills you're learning on how to give back to the community, really very impressive and you should be very proud. And hopefully this is gonna be a lifelong habit that you have. Congratulations on showing us what true leaders are in the community. You guys did a great job. The, uh, 
Yeah, great job public speaking. By now the whole board knows that in fifth grade I would have been terrified to speak in front of a group of adults like this. Um, but thanks for mentioning um, Dr. Seuss. Uh, the, it brought me back to, I'm um, sure your age or younger, reading Go Dog Go, Cat in, a, Cat in the Hat, and uh, Green Eggs and Ham. I used to just stare at the pages and the crazy drawings wondering how he did them. You know, where did all that uh, imagination come from that he had? So anyway, great job and uh, thank you. Yeah, presentations like this is exactly why I love as a board member being able to tour the schools, just to be able to learn about things like this where they're not only impacting their school, but the community as a whole. It's outstanding work. Exactly, I think you guys did an outstanding job. Keep up the good work. Um, one of my favorite things as well is to see our students in action in front of the board and you guys just do an unbelievable job and we're impressed every time we get to see them. Thank you. Yeah, congrats. Great job, guys. And Mr. Krieger, thank you so much for your leadership. Yeah, thank you. And for your 39 years of service. That's wonderful. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for the kids. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to item B, uh, student representative report. Uh, we will not have that tonight, uh, so we're going to move on to item C, district health update. Mr. Stausler. Yes, I'm going to have uh, nurse uh, Tammy Mamiak uh, present. Do I really do I really have to go after those kids? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, that was pretty awesome. I don't know anyone who could beat that. And now I think I just moved this mic, like, don't fall on me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give a couple updates. So what I had all the health aides do for me today is give me a couple different numbers. So I have the amount of cases, positive student cases that we had in March for each building. And then I had them go through and do the same thing for April. So I have the amount of cases we've had for March and April so far for each building plus the amount of kids that we had to quarantine in addition to how many positive kids came out of those quarantine situations. So for example, Amy Bell in March had zero student cases, positive cases. In <coughs> April, we had four so far. Out of those four, we had actually only had to quarantine one person and unfortunately that was our building administrator. <laughs> uh, but other than that, no other quarantine for Amy Bell. Rockfield, we had zero cases in March. In April, we've had two, but those also happened over spring break, so we did not have to do any contact tracing for that, so that was really well. County line, in March, we had two. We had to quarantine 10 students from that. Zero positive cases came out of those 10 students that were in quarantine. MacArthur, again, zero cases in March. We've had one in April so far. Again, that was over spring break where we had to not do any quarantine for that. KMS, however, we've had nine positive students in March, which came out to be 155 student quarantines and three faculty members. Out of those 155 students that had to go in quarantine, we had only four students that came out positive. When I talk about those four students that came out positive, does not necessarily mean that it happened because they were in contact in school. A lot of times what happens is, is because they had contact outside of school. So I just want to make that pretty clear. So far here in April at KMS, we had two positive student cases, zero had to quarantine because again, those happened over spring break. G GHS, the high school, in March we had nine positive cases. We had to quarantine 68 students. No positive cases came out of those 68 students. In April, so far we've had five positive cases, 69 students had to quarantine, and only one positive case came out of those 69 students that had to quarantine. Again, it was not probably because they were in school, it was most likely outside of school that that positive happened. Not sure if that was even because they were together with that positive person or if that was an outside situation that just happened to correlate. So in addition to all of that, um, I just want to state too that I also received the weekly respiratory report from DHS 
that doesn't just talk about COVID, but it talks about all respiratory illnesses, um, including cold, influenza, pneumonia, all those things. And so far, uh, your flu season actually starts October 1st and runs through the end of March. In this flu season, we have had only 68 cases in the state of Wisconsin for influenza. We have had zero in Germantown School District of influenza. In the entire nation, there has been only one pediatric death in the entire nation. On average, we have over 180 kids that die of flu every year. We also have had no stomach flu, which is the norovirus. We've had a couple kids throw up, have a lot of vomiting, but not it was not related to a stomach flu or a norovirus. So what that's telling me is that the mitigation measures that we have in place are working. The kids that do end up testing positive is not because it's coming from school, it's because it's coming from outside of school. Even when you look at our activities outside of school, as in our athletics, band, choir, all those things, we are not seeing a spread throughout those. We did see a couple different things that might have been a spread within, but you have to look at what that activity was and how close and interactive those individuals were. There were some situations maybe in some basketball or wrestling, but you didn't see anything in volleyball. You really didn't see anything in soccer. You didn't see any of those kind of cases in those activities where people were more spread out. It was more where they were really had that close body-to-body -body contact within that, I'd say even closer than two feet. So that's really where you would see more kids from an activity would have a positive situation than you would in anything else. Um, I also want to tell you that our vaccine rate is actually really, really well. As of just a few minutes ago when I looked, we have 539 staff members currently that have at least one vaccine. Most of them have had both of their vaccines already, but that's just um, how they filled out the Google form that I keep track of. Those that are post two weeks of their second vaccine do not have to ever quarantine again. Originally, it was they got 90 days to not have to quarantine after their second vaccine, but now CDC updated their guidelines to never have to quarantine again two weeks post their second dose. Mm. So we're pretty close. A lot of our staff members are pretty close to that area. We have had to quarantine a couple because it was within a few days of getting that second vaccine or it was within a few days of getting their first vaccine. So unfortunately, it didn't fall within those guidelines. So we did have to quarantine them, but it's becoming very rare that we have to do that. So keep up the good work, staff. Keep getting those vaccines because the more we get those vaccines, the less we can do this stuff that we're doing. Um, CDC also did quite a few updates very recently. So we talk a lot about that three feet distance versus that six feet distance. So what that means is CDC said students in the buildings can be within three feet of each other. That's allowing schools to bring in more kids into the classroom. You can see almost in any kind of research article that you wanna look at, there is no spread in schools really, but that's because of the mitigation that we have in place. It's not because they're six feet apart, it's not because that, it's because of the masking, it's because of the hand washing, because you can see our kids are not six feet apart. Our kids aren't even three feet apart. And it's really because we have the masks, we're doing the hand washing, we're keeping our younger kids in the pods and things like that. So that's really what's working and what's keeping our schools, not just Germantown, but everywhere open and doing a good job. Um, with that three feet, CDC did say that their quarantine guidelines does not change. It's still a six foot radius in order to be with that quarantine. Um, Mr. Stauslin and I are looking at about maybe changing some of those things, but that won't be happening right now. It'll be looking more towards fourth quarter. Um, let's see. For the masks, I have to say that our students are doing still I mean, we're in April now. I can't believe how well they're doing. We have no, really no issues with masking. Our kids are very, very compliant. The compliance rate is extremely high. We really have had no complaints about them. If we do see something, we ask them to put their mask up right away, and they do. They follow those rules. We have prom coming up. We have forward testing. We have AP testing. We have spring sports coming up. All of those things can happen and can continue to happen as long as we keep our masks on. 
And even when you look at all of the research, even at CDC, DHS, no matter where you look, that is the most important tool that we have to stay open and keep everybody safe. It's even more important than the hand washing. It's even more important than keeping in pods. It's really our number one thing that's keeping everything together right now. All right, that's all I got. Which, which questions you got for me? <laughs> wow, a lot of good stuff you just shared. A um, couple questions. Yeah. I would also suggest that in addition to the mask, it's, it's the, the, the awareness that we didn't have before. If you're sick, stay home. And I think that correlates with the numbers of the, the lack of numbers in influenza, which I think is wonderful uh, in the state. If Absolutely. you're sick, stay you're right. home. Yep. Uh, and, and we enforce that very, very yeah. well, I think. Yeah. And the parents do a really good job. They call in, even if a kid's sniffling, they call in and like, nope, my kid's sniffling, they're just gonna stay home. All right, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been dealing with this thing for way too long. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, it's not sustainable. I think we all agree with that. And I love the numbers of uh, 539. Uh, what percentage of that of it's staff? About 80, it's about 89 percent. 89 percent. That's wonderful. 89. Okay, I had 82. So. Okay, 89 percent. Okay. Yep. I got my two shots, so uh, I didn't know uh, what you shared about quarantine. So I think that's great. Uh, I don't have to do that, uh, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, question on the 60 plus kids at the high school quarantining. Yep. Are we, did we, did um, CDC pivot from the 14 days to 10 days? Yeah, and we've been doing 10 days, oh my gosh, for months, I think now already. So it, they did, they went from a, 10, from a 14 day to a 10 day. And the reason they did that is because if you look at the average for a person who's been actually exposed to a positive case, the average amount of time that a person would actually get symptoms if they contracted it and started an infection is between days six, seven, and eight. So that's the average of when symptoms start. So that's why they really went to the 10 day quarantine. However, you still can develop symptoms and develop an infection all the way up until day 14, but it's not. The closer you get to that day 14, the less and less amount of probability is that you will actually receive an infection. So we have been doing the 10 day quarantine for quite a few months now. And the other piece to that too, Bob, is that if you get tested on day six or seven, you get a negative test result, you still have no symptoms, you can actually return to school or normal activities on day eight. So you actually can reduce it even three more days. Well, you set my next comment up perfectly well. So, you know, 16 or 60 plus kids yeah. knocked out uh, is not a good thing. No. It's not good for their education, certainly no. not for their psyche. What can we do as a district to shorten that? And I'm gonna put this on the table for discussion. Uh, have we thought about doing our own antigen testing. I have not thought about it. It's a rapid the test, antigen 15 antigen minutes, uh, negative or positive, that type of thing. Have we, have we thought about that yet? I'm gonna be very point blank. I have not thought about it. I have not had time to think about it. I have <laughs> not had time to research it. Yeah, and this so may not even not. be a, a topic of discussion in the fall because again, we're learning, we're maturing. Yep. Oh, I um, hope we don't have to do this in fall. You know, <laughs> will we be wearing masks in the fall? I really hope not. Oh, I know. And, <laughs> I'm uh, telling you, I hope not. So it, it's uh, interesting what's going on. Yeah. Um, comments? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've received emails, I'm sure the rest of the board has as well, from parents saying that we're doing long-term damage physically and mentally to the kids for wearing masks. What's your medical prof or, you know, opinion on that? I don't, I don't think that we're doing that so much. The masking is causing that, to be honest with you. I think it's the entire situation in general. It's the quarantine, it's the unknown, it's the, oh my gosh, I have to do virtual today. Oh my gosh, am I gonna be able to play sports? Oh my gosh, am I gonna get my assignments in? My computer's not working. What's, I think it's not just masks. I think it's the entire thing in general, this whole, and it doesn't just affect the kids, it infects everyone. You know, my kid's sick, my grandparents are sick, so and so sick. I think it's, it's not really a mask issue. I think it's an everything issue. I don't think the masks, I mean, there's, there's people that wear them all day long. It's a huge thing in healthcare. I wore a mask almost an entire work day, eight hours. I wear my mask almost entirely the entire day now, even when I'm alone in my office, because it is an airborne. 
it's in the air. So whether I'm in my office alone, take off my mask and have someone walk in, it's in the air regardless. So I wear my mask almost 24 seven while I'm in the buildings. I rarely take it off and I don't, the more I wear it, the less I even think I even have it on. So that's my professional opinion. Right. And I have had a couple research articles that I have read on my own time about that, and it is more the isolation that the research is showing versus masking. All right, thank you. Yep. Would data support, um, you know, for the younger kids, yeah. like an Amy Bell? Um, and we're more than likely going to talk about this yeah. later on in the agenda on return to school about um, wearing masks or not wearing masks or make it optional. Uh, younger kids aren't getting sick and if you know we've got 89% of staff that have had least their first inoculation um, relatively low risk as long as we follow all the other mitigation sick stay home um, that type of thing what are your thoughts on that I say no and I know that's not what everyone wants to hear. And, and there's a couple reasons behind that. Number one, we still are only at 89% with at least one vaccine. So not everybody is fully vaccine. And number two, we still have 20% of our staff who are not. So that still gives us a pretty big number. Um, and our kids, we, our kids can still, may not necessarily have an active infection where they develop and have symptoms, but they still can be carriers and can still spread. So it's really that concern about okay, my friend Johnny over here, we don't have masks on, but he's breathing all over me, could be an asymptomatic carrier and have a positive case, give it to his neighbor, and then that neighbor goes home to grandma and grandpa. We don't know if they had the vaccine. We don't know if their parents had the vaccine, and that's what we need to be cautious of. Yes, our kids are not getting it as much. Our kids do not show active infections. However, kids, younger kids, are now starting to trickle and starting to see more and more infections in younger kids, but not as extreme as, as we do in adults. But we are starting to see that trickle down effect, and that's why I say no. But we're not seeing it at the Germantown School District, though. We are not with our kids, but it's still, we don't know if they bring it home to the people that I they live with. And that's where my concern lies. Yeah, what about if I'm just in my classroom, and but if I go out in the hall and ride the bus, I wear my mask? We make that continue. You still have a child next to you that's less than three feet away. But we're having that right now. What was that? We're having that right now mm -hmm. in our schools. I know. And they have masks on. Right. And they need to keep their masks on. Gotcha. Yep. And even, even within that three feet, it's more important to have your masks on the closer you are to that student or to anybody else the further you are away. I mean, if we were able to have all of our kids be six feet apart, I would say, yeah, maybe, but we're not. Our, our classrooms are packed, jam-packed, I've seen them. Those kids are pretty tight. They really need to have those masks on. So when do you think there's gonna be the paradigm shift within I'm our I'm hoping school this region? summer, I'm not gonna lie. I'm really hoping. I well, why, why, why the summer? Why the summer and why not tomorrow? Because we're gonna have more people that are able to be vaccinated. The more people in the country that are gonna have that vaccine, the less spread that we will be able to have, the more people are protected. And then everyone should be able to start to take them off and throw them in the garbage. We are only at about one in four adults right now in the country who are vaccinated, and we need to get that number higher to take these, be able to take these off. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Any other comments? Very good. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, right. Tammy. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Tammy. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to item D, 4K update. Mr. Stauslin. Yes, I want to have Mrs. O'Brien talk about 4K. Sir. Let me get your slides. Thank you. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? So uh, the proposal um, that we are um, working on is to implement a half-day 4K program beginning with the 22-23 school year. So the benefits of having a 4K program can really be summed up in this slide. The research tends to support the longer-term benefits of 4K. And by longer-term benefits, I mean for students to be able to be more proficient or more likely to be proficient in reading by third grade, more likely to graduate from high school and attend a college, and more likely to succeed in the workplace. The research tends to be a little bit more inconclusive regarding shorter term benefits of how well prepared they are for kindergarten. However, the shorter term benefits of preparedness for kindergarten is more conclusive 
regarding income levels, and as you can see on that statement on the bottom, the research suge suggests that students from lower incomes who attend a high quality 4K program tend to be better, better prepared for kindergarten. So the updates um, as to where we are um, uh, to this evening is that there is a stated board goal of having a 4K program. It was advertised in the community for early childhood providers and current 4K programs in Germantown. We met with several providers to discuss possible partnerships or those who would want to partner with us to also offer a 4K program in their um, building. And we also created a draft of a partnership agreement and what that might look like for those organizations who are wanting to partner with us. And we did hold our first meeting for the 4K steering committee last week where um, staff were invited to come. I talked about all of the updates so far and we started to form some subcommittees of some work and some areas in which we want to make sure that we are um, doing early on and then also created kind of a timeline for um, the work that needs to follow. Next slide. So the logistics that, that we're thinking about um, as it stands today is that we are um, offering a tuition-free half-day program. We are considering five days a week, either having an AM or a PM session. Again, those time frames are just considerations. We would follow the school district's calendar in terms of dates. As of right now, we do have space in all of our buildings for 4K. However, I just want to make note that um, we don't have enough space to accommodate all students at all of their home schools. Right now, we have the most space available at MacArthur, so not all students may be able to attend their home school for 4K. We also don't have space to accommodate wraparound care at this time, and this is where some of those uh, community partnerships could come, um, would be beneficial for our families. And we do have um, transportation that would be provided to and from the 4K program. Right now, we're in conversations um, with the following partners. We have Camp Minakani, who's um, really close to Amy Bell School, actually. Uh, they are part of the YMCA. They are interested in having a nature-based 4K program based on where their property um, is, and also a possible partnership for uh, a 4K program. They are also interested in offering wraparound care. Momentum Early Learning is also interested in a possible 4K and wraparound care. Willow Creek is interested in wraparound care. And Bethlehem Lutheran may be interested in a partnership. I talked to them most recently. Uh, they might be interested in a, in a possible partnership. So just to, I just want to clarify. Um, first of all, thank you, Brenda, for doing all the work since, I don't know, July when we started talking about this. And um, I think, the, the, just so people understand, the when, let's take example momentum, um, you know, possible interest in 4K, interested in wraparound care, that means we, we would potentially ha have the half-day kindergarten at that location, but it would be our teacher, our curriculum, and then if, let's say, it was the morning, in the afternoon, a parent could keep their child at Momentum uh, to, to be there as, as daycare, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct, and we would actually, the partnership agreement that we've uh, proposed would uh, work out the staffing as well as the curricular piece for that. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and I just put together a timeline. Uh, again, the steering committee uh, for the subgroups is going to meet again uh, before the end of the year. I would like to have marketing prom and promotional materials available in November. I would like to register students um, beginning in January of 2022 uh, with the possibility of registering with our current kindergarten class and holding both registrations at the same time. And then 4K opening on September 1 of, uh, well, whenever that first date of the school year is decided in um, September of 2022. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions for, for Brenda? Brenda, one of the questions that had come up during the campaign from one of the candidates was wondering, given that the declaration of a 4K, you can do that, I think, up until like May 1st. And they were wondering 
why we wouldn't be embarking on starting 4K in the fall. And so could you just maybe describe some of the, maybe the in the weeds planning stuff as to why you can't just in April decide you're going to have 4K in fall? Sure. One of the biggest um, pieces is obviously the curricular piece and making sure that we have quality uh, programs for our 4K program. I would like to do some professional development around developmentally appropriate uh, curriculum as well for those staff members who are um, interested in teaching 4K. So those are the two um, big pieces. Obviously promotional materials and making um, families aware of this would be an important step in this process. And again, for staffing and making sure that we have registration and everything to make sure that that happens in a timely manner so that we can start the hiring and staffing um, as, w as well as making sure that our partners are um, making sure that they have a commitment and knowing and communicating with them, uh, their expectations, responsibilities, things like that, as well as um, being able to promote um, some of that wraparound care or any of the programs that they might be interested in. So really, this is not simply just, we've got classroom space, let's put some teachers in there and teach 4K. Uh, I would like to make right. sure that it's a quality program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, just and, wanted and to make that clear. Yeah, and to that too is you have to outfit the room with the proper Correct. Uh, furniture, and that all has a has an initial cost, but it's, it is a, it, it does, it's a positive in the end when you have the, the bodies um, for FTE. And I do, um, there is a grant available as well for this. Um, I thought it worked in the same way that the charter school grant did. However, it as, actually is that May 1st deadline. So I would be applying for it at this time next year. It's already filled out, it's ready to go. Um, so I would just change the date for uh, making sure that it's next year and then that we would be able to take advantage of some of those funds that are startup costs for 4K. Um, Brenda, real quick. The curriculums that you are looking at, are they play-based education? Absolutely, that's what I started with. Um, I, I, when we had the staff um, meeting, I said that we would start with the play-based understanding and social and emotional learning as um, big components and, and uh, cornerstones on which we build the curriculum. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian. Question, um, is 4K then required if we offer it for parents or can they opt out of it? That's a great question. It is, it is not required. Um, kindi uh, attending kindergarten is required before first grade, but 4K is not required. Brenda, I've been on the board going on 10 years. Uh, we heard comments that um, about 30 years we've been talking about K-4. Uh, we've been talking about K-4 in my 10 years. Why are we finally going down this path? Why haven't we done it before? I mean, the testing here is very, very good within the Germantown School District, especially with the younger kids. So why now? There's no time like the present. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, good, good response. I, I want to think that we've got great moms and dads at home that read stories to their kids in bed at nighttime, and they teach them how to add. Uh, they teach them how to spell. And when they get into kindergarten, they're wonderful kids because testing supports that. Mm -hmm. And I would say too, um, just like I presented with the research, um, I think what's important is that making sure that all students have an opportunity for high quality education prior to kindergarten, um, and that would, be, that would be a focus as well. I would agree with that. Cool. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, to President Satterberg's point, yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, I think you've done great work so far in, in this little short amount of time, identifying how the program is going to look, all the things that are needed to go into it. And I, I understand why we can't have it ready for next year. I mean, we want to do it right, and it's going to take a little bit extra time. But um, I think seeing the dates, we finally know it's coming. Mm -hmm. So that's great. OK, thank you. Any other comments? OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, moving on to, uh, yeah. Before we get to the enrollment update, since we're doing updates, could I just read a statement regarding transportation committee? Wonderful, quick? perfect. All right. So in regards to the transportation changes and the start and end times for 2021-2022 school year, we've been receiving some questions, so I wanted to clarify a few items. The Transportation Committee met on February 22nd and March 23rd to discuss multiple options go right way developed regarding maximizing bus routes for the 2021-2022 school year moving forward. At the March 23rd meeting, the committee approved the concept 
with the understanding that administration will recommend start and end times to the full board before approval. From March 23rd until April 26th next week, or two weeks, administration will continue to communicate with site principals and staff regarding families and students. Human resources will re look into regarding the traveling teachers. We'll also be communicating with Park and Rec regarding before and after school care and activities. We'll also be communicating with food service regarding breakfast and lunch needs, and also right way regarding pickup and drop off times. Comments and questions and concerns are going to be reported to the full board on April 26th, so an informed decision can be made at that time. And I just want to clarify, there has been no decision made yet. Just so that's transparent. Great, thank you, Mr. Borden. Thank you. Moving on to item E, enrollment update. Mr. Stauslin. Yes, that's Mr. Nowak. Thank you. We have a uh, enrollment update that we passed. Um, as we look at it, as you may recall, a little different this year than the previous years, and that we put the two versions in. Um, we feel comfortable with um, most, uh, all of our in-person uh, classroom enrollment numbers. There are two uh, areas, fourth grade at Amy Bell and fourth grade at Mac, that are sort of pushing the envelope, uh, but they're still within those limits of where we would change. So in terms of where we are in the school year and how classroom situations have been managed, as we talked about um, in an early agenda item, um, we feel pretty good. Um, listed as well are the virtual numbers. Um, you know, and those have, have um, you know, changed a little bit over the years, but we feel comfortable with where they're at. This document sets the stage for um, our staffing plan, which will be presented likely at our next meeting. Uh, what isn't uh, known really at this point is those incoming kindergarten numbers. Those are always a bit of a, of a mystery relative to how enrollments are coming in at this point. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, some of the where some of the classes have crept up is that kids who have been who've chosen virtual for the semester uh, needed to come back in for a family situation or reason. Either uh, the the child care person had to go back to work, or um, the grandparent that was around is no longer around, and um, so. But we've there's. Uh, it, Several schools. Some other parents have tried uh, to or asked their child to come back, and we just we we, we can't. We're we're plumb full, and that was part of the reason of asking families to make the commitment at semester. Um, but we have, when there's been um, extenuating circumstances, tried to accommodate um, when we can. And we do have, if you remember, uh, a fifth grade at MacArthur where the teacher. Um, not to, because we would have gone over if those kids came back when they made that choice at semester where she has some kids in person and she's also doing the virtual at the same time. And um, to, again, to try to try to make that work. And we're really kind of holding on for the, the next two months, um, you know, with our numbers in a couple, couple spots. But we're, those ones that are at 27, um, we just, we can't add more to that. And if, if kids move in, we've had actually three kids that, just moved into Amy Bell this last week um, that we're figuring out their their placement two of the classes is not an issue and and one it make keeps it tight so okay okay any other questions comments okay thank you very much uh, before we go on to item six building committee I just want to uh, add something to the reports and information items and as you know we had an election uh, a week ago, week and a half ago, two weeks ago, whenever it was. And uh, my colleague to the left uh, will be transitioning off the board. And uh, Sarah has been on the board for the past nine years. Um, and through those nine years, we've done a lot uh, within the Germantown School District. I think you came right on uh, the heels of Act 10 and all associated with that and the, the savings associated with that. Uh, we've been through um, pivoting away from Common Core. And yes, we are still pivoting away from Common Core. We're not embracing that. Um, we heard comments tonight about the fund balance, uh, the improper use of the fund balance, which I totally disagree with. This is a three-track school. If we didn't take money out of the fund balance, which you were part of, 
uh, this would be still be a two-track school. We purchased land across the street for a septic field. We expanded the building here, not just here, but in Rockfield. Uh, we paid $1.2 million out of fund balance, which you were a part of, for the tech center at the high school. We purchased two buildings, two homes over at MacArthur to improve parking lot safety, which you were a part of. You were a part of the wonderful uh, school report cards, exceeds expectations. Uh, we just heard from our, our superintendent that we've had people moving into the district. Uh, I chatted with a, a lady who moved in here, uh, to Amy Bell from Hartford in February because she likes what she sees in Germantown. You were part of that for the last nine years. So uh, I want to personally thank you for all that you've done uh, for the Germantown School District and I wish you nothing but success in your future endeavors. But before I let you go, uh, there's a certificate here I'd like to give you from the uh, Wisconsin Association of School Boards. Certificate of Commendation is presented to Sarah Larson in recognition for your service to the children in Wisconsin Public Schools, April 2012 to April 2021. And it's signed by their president and their executive director. So on behalf of the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, uh, at the Germantown Board of Education and also myself, I want to thank you for always putting kids first. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> it's been a great nine years and I'm very proud to have served the community and had such great colleagues. Congratulations to my opponent, Tracy Pollock. He's been faithfully attending the meetings, and I'm sure you're all going to welcome him on board and start with the next chapter. Mike? Yeah, hey, uh, it's been a pleasure serving with you, Sarah, uh, but I did want to mention uh, something about Amy Bell School here. The referendum was to have taken the school to a two-track school, and the reason being it was uh, septic system locked so we spent the money to put the septic system across the street, which I affectionately say one day will be called the Mike Loth Memorial <laughs> Septic System because it was my idea to do it. But um, as a result of uh, spending that money and expanding this school to a three-track school, because that's what it took to do it outside of the referendum, there's now room on this side of the road to expand it to a four-track school. And it's very likely with the uh, growing population in Richfield that we're gonna need that. So uh, while the fund balance is constantly criticized, it was money well spent. And quite honestly, we couldn't be talking about K-4 right now if we had let this, this school fall to a two-track school. You know, so let's be happy, we spent the money, we have room for four tracks here, not today, but with an expansion, and we can do 4K, I believe, here and at Rockfield and also at MacArthur. MacArthur was actually part of the referendum, but Rockfield was not. So that's, that's it. And sorry for shooting off a different direction, Sarah, but it, it has been a, a pleasure. Uh, serving with you and, and you will be missed. I'm sure the new guy will do a good job also. So we'll, we'll go from there. Thanks, Thank you. Mike. All right. Thank you, everyone. You Moving on to item six, building committee. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Medved. Yes, yeah, so we did meet early there tonight. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are recording and taping all of our committee meetings now. So I'll make it brief. Um, we do have one actionable item for tonight, we bring forward to the board with a positive recommendation to award the Germantown High School track resurfacing project as described to Athletic Field Services in an amount not to exceed 91,000 for Seal Flex LR6. Thank you, that's coming to the board with a positive recommendation, doesn't require a second, do we have discussion? Mike. The, uh, it was brought up in building committee, but uh, I checked, it is part of the 10-year plan, and I thought, wow, this 10-year plan is already 
uh, coming into effect, you know, how time flies. So it's, it is for the 2021-2022 uh, school year. Uh, there was a little more money budgeted for this than the 91000 so I was quite happy to see uh, where the number came in. And uh, all in all, it looks like a, a good deal. We're going to have the, finally have the track resurfaced. Further comments, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And that we all. <laughs> Very good. Question, comments for Mr. Medved? Okay, moving on to item seven, ad hoc curriculum committee update. Mr. Bedford. Yes, we did meet earlier as well. Um, we have several action items to bring forward tonight. First, we have a motion to the board with a positive recommendation to approve the second step personal safety materials updated. There is no cost to this approval. That's coming to the board with a positive recommendation. Doesn't require a second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. We did have several other conversations. If I may, I will turn it over to Ms. Larson. She has some uh, motions she'd like to present. Okay. Uh, the first one we bring forward with a positive recommendation that the use of the N-word or any other racial derogatory language by any race even used regarding towards their own race will result in suspension and restorative practice supported through the guidance department with escalation upon repeat offenses. And as a side note, the administration will craft the language and bring that back to the board for approval. Okay, that's coming to the board. The positive recommendation doesn't require a second. Discussion. And I will just say, to frame the conversation, this is coming from an incident that happened at the high school um, unfortunately several weeks ago and um, we need to move forward with this so that uh, all students know the expectations of what is right and what is wrong because what happened in the cafeteria during lunchtime was wrong and unfortunately that word is used uh, far too often it's used um, by permission it's used uh, unfortunately by a lot of people and it's wrong and it's not accepted and within the Germantown School District. When Mr. Stouse and myself sat down with two of the three students that were involved in that matter, um, we learned a lot, uh, which was the domino effect for the ACE Committee um, coming around, which is a wonderful committee and all the other good things that are happening. But this is just one step of many steps in our um, equity inclusion program that we need to do. Very important first step. Further comments, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Okay, the next motion is uh, we bring forward it that an assembly will be placed on the calendar within the next three weeks for both GHS and the middle school addressing the race situation and how to properly interact and behave and treat people like human beings. Yeah, and uh, th that's coming to the board with a positive recommendation. Mm -hmm. does not require a second. Uh, discussion. Again, getting back to our conversation that we had with uh, two of the three students um, that Mr. Slaus and myself had, again, we learned a lot, and we listened to them, and we asked the question, what do you want done? And they had a wonderful idea. They said, let's have a school assembly, let's talk about it. And that's what we're doing. We want to go that next step. Uh, again, the very critical step, one of many more steps that we need to have within the Germantown School District that will support our uh, DEI program, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. The last motion that we are bringing forward revolves around critical race theory and it, um, based on the ACE committee and it, the work that we're looking to do within the district, 
really critical race theory is a political agenda, not really helping the marginalized groups and really wouldn't be fitting to the lasting change that we're looking to achieve. So I make a motion that the Germantown School District will not be employing critical race theory content or pedagogy in curriculum delivery. And that too coming to the board with a positive recommendation doesn't require a second. Do we have discussion? And again, I'm looking very, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the ACE committee. I'm looking forward to um, the collaboration, the content that's coming out of that committee. Not just today, but six months from now, a year from now, because we could do better. When we sat down with the students, when they said that they don't feel safe, well, guess what? They're not learning in our school, and we want the kids to learn. Um, so I'm really excited about uh, what the future holds for the ACE Committee, with the assembly, with all the other things that we're doing. Uh, Germantown has always been a thought leader. We've always been a visionary. We've done a lot of things thinking outside the box uh, with Common Core and other things. So uh, I, I support what you're saying, Sarah. I support your motion. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And I think that's it for you, right? I think so. Okay, Mr. Medva. Okay, we had a couple of other updates, but those will be coming back to the board at a later date, so I'll leave it for them. Okay, questions, comments for Mr. Medved. All right, moving on to uh, item eight, unfinished business, discussion and update on possible relocation of district office and property sale. Mr. Stauslin. Yes, uh, several months ago we had, um, at the board level, had talked about the possibility of um, selling or looking to sell the district office and um, and the land, and we could, and it stemmed from we had someone approach me way back in August, and so it, it started this conversation of, well, what's its value? What's its worth? Um, what would happen if if it did sell? And so from that last meeting. Uh, myself and uh, Ms. Altendorf were kind of tasked with if we had to move, is there room for everybody? Everybody in the dis currently that's in the district office. And the, the truth is if we absolutely had to, um, we could find, find spaces. It wouldn't be ideal, but we could find space. Uh, some of the question, though, was also around the maintenance building that was there, and there's possible options um, for that, you know, to, again, if a tornado came through and wiped out all the buildings. Could we find a space? Uh, the district office people, we, we could. Um, again, not ideal. And um, the, the the sentiment um, kind of after looking at the spaces was, you know, at this time we should just leave leave it alone. Um, keep, keep the building. We know we have um, an option in the future uh, Possibly, if we if we get you know to that down that road, um, there's some unknowns in our district as far as growth as well. Um, you know, so we we have those five acres that the the site sits on um, as well. So at, at this point, um, the sentiment was we we just leave it as is. Okay, questions, comments, Michael. Yeah, I think. Testing. Yeah, at this point, um, I agree we shouldn't do anything. It's an asset. I was actually surprised when the utilities and future, near future uh, maintenance costs are added in. The building is actually <clears throat> much, much lower cost to operate than I expected. And um, I'd, I'd like to reiterate, uh, we were approached uh, by another party, it wasn't the other way around, and this really had nothing to do with a, a budget uh, shortfall. So I intend to work with Brittany, and I'm sure the rest of the board does also, to do everything we can to balance the budget, and it does not necessarily include uh, selling, you know, the district office. So it's an asset. I'd like to keep it at this point, and uh, I think that's the end of it for the next probably few years, I'm guessing. Yeah, and again, uh, thank you for bringing that up, the history. Uh, you know, someone knocked on our door uh, to purchase the property. 
not just one person, but two people did, and then you're thinking you're putting your business hat on. And this, again, this has nothing to do with the budget because we will have a balanced budget. We have a strategy in place for the budget. We have a strategy in place to uh, replenish the fund balance. So I feel extremely confident that uh, we will succeed in that. But when someone asks, puts an offer of a million, a million two on the table, you got to think back and say, okay, what's the right use of that building? Um, can we put staff in other buildings? And I think at that time, the, question, the, the answer was yes, we could. So then you're thinking, okay, why wouldn't we sell it? It's no different than sitting on property over at uh, Kinderberg Park on Dodgers Bay, uh, where the community did not have an appetite to build a new school. We didn't want to be in the land business, so we went down the path of selling 15, 16 acres. And I'm pleased to see that there's two basements being built right now. So there's homes coming in there. Yes, we didn't get the price that we wanted, but there's uh, issues associated with that, and I could go into reasons why that happened. But again, we got out of the land business. So, um, and there, you know, we don't know what, you know, six months from now, a year from now. Um, what that building holds. Maybe K4 will be in there, who knows? Uh, I doubt that the community has appetite for a new school. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would rather, to Mr. Lothi, you mentioned this could be a four-track school here. Yeah, that's right. probably gonna happen before we build a new school, so. Questions, comments for Mr. Stelson? Okay, moving on to uh, item nine, new business discussion of possible action regarding return to school. Mr. Stossel. Yep, so just our um, our twice a month report on the um, kind of where we're at. Again, this, these the numbers are just to give us a, an idea between the two weeks. Um, you can see that in all categories, um, the burden rate has has gone up. And again, that's that's a, a trend uh, in the in the area as well as um, you know the every time we hear reports on COVID numbers from the area superintendents as well as that they've just again uh, February was low uh, start of March was low then it started to pick up with with case numbers so um, it matches what we're seeing across the communities um, this is our this is on our website the COVID dashboard it, it's updated each week um, this is what uh, Tammy was talking about as far as kind of the our pupil counts with quarantine numbers. Um, I know it's pretty f hard to see from there, uh, but again, it is on our on our website and it, it gets updated daily. Um, so, uh, and then um, just a couple things, you know, to, to note: elementary the cases uh, continue to occur, middle school cases continue to occur, um, and kind of repeating some of the things that Tammy talked about. But you know, at our our high school and our middle school, we have spring activities that are becoming in um, full bloom. And from everything from AP testing to, to proms to um, what else we have going on, graduation is coming uh, as well. And, and the more we can keep our, our kids safe and they can participate in all these events, uh, that's our goal with this. And I do have uh, Mr. Farron here. Um, if he would like to talk about anything related to um, some of these activities and, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. It looks like my <laughs> Different font. <laughs> so it ended up being 22 uh, today. So uh, as Sandy mentioned in those numbers, the last three days have been uh, the days that it hit us pretty hard so when those conversations about the mask come up I don't, I don't like wearing a mask either I'm fully vaccinated I never got quarantined and now I'm not able to get quarantined which is awesome so I should sell my uh, because they have my two weeks beyond that but those numbers are going up and I just worry about uh, especially you know we have the Aspire test for freshmen and sophomores on Wednesday and some of those kids got quarantined or Scott Offell had to meet to try to make this list and the list is getting longer for the makeup date. Uh, manageable, yeah, they can always opt out if they need to. Uh, AP, if we run into a major quarantine problem for that, it'd be disastrous for those kids, and they pay for those uh, to get college credit. So um, 
Did you want me to speak about events? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one event, well, one general comment. I just got this I, I email to find out. So at the end of semester one, we were 35% of our students who are virtual only. And um, more and more, I think, fell off at that time, some for athletics. At the beginning of semester two, we were at 21%. We just ended third quarter on uh, Wednesday, started fourth quarter on Thursday. Thursday. And we we're down to 17% virtual only, so that number is trending in the right direction. Um, one of the things I want to make the board aware of, um, and I talked to Mr. Stileson about this, and I'll just be real frank and honest, this is a, a very disappointing uh, thing that I want to share with the board. Uh, I'll share it publicly because people know about it. Um, last March, April, May, uh, we received emails from parents uh, from the class of 2021 about prom, and they thought we should have still held prom during a pandemic. We all along said we want to do right by this class. We want to be able to do these things. So um, City Collins is our prom advisor. I'll just speak specifically to the prom issue and has worked with the River Club in Mequon. And so we had another date of November 14th of 2020, obviously not able to hold it at that time. They held, held our deposit, continued to move forward. We put March 14th was the next date. Didn't meet that deadline. So now we, uh, the prom committee had organized two proms. So for the administrative team and for the members that work, it's a busy weekend. We have Friday night is to be at the River Club with the class of 2021 because they didn't have their prom and then the normal junior prom the next day. So in the process of all this, working through um, the financial piece and the River Club of Mequon has been awesome to us in dealing with them. So I guess it would have been, what is today, Monday? Late last week, um, we found out that there's a parent group of seniors, class 2021, uh, that don't want to follow the provisions of masks distancing and have attained a location to run their own prom. Um, that's their prerogative, but here um, is what I received from Mrs. Collins in regard to the impact of that. We have to meet a threshold for the amount of tickets um, sold, the amount of money that is spent on that. Um, right now, the sales, because of the Friday night prom, um, aren't, aren't very high, we won't meet that threshold. Uh, they want to go do their own thing, fine. Um, I have all the emails in a folder of complaints um, and my responses, they responded every one of them about how we wanted to write by this class. And um, they found a location, Mr. Stuzzle knows what it is and probably going to address that to make sure that they understand that this is not a school sponsored prom, that there will be no liability to the district in regard to this. If, um, and you can chime in because you, know, you have the email too, if we're unable to meet the, the threshold of students for a combination of Friday and Saturday, it puts the Saturday prom for the class of 2022 in jeopardy, where we would not be able to uh, have the financial amount to do that. Uh, so I'll be honest, this is a public meeting. Um, it's unfortunate. I believe it's selfish. It's putting both classes in jeopardy after all the work that went into trying to do this for both of them because they don't want to wear masks, they don't want to socially distance, and they're making that choice. But the impact is great to many others. Um, Mrs. Collins has a meeting with uh, the event manager from the River Club. We've asked them to bend over backwards 20 times, and they've been great. She has a meeting on the 20th um, to discuss this. We're in, what, what, what did I, how many tickets have been sold? Like just a-, a Like 50, under, um, yeah, like 15. 15 and 12 so far. Yep. Um, so this unfortunately has had a great impact. And again, they've decided to do it on their own. I don't know. And, yeah, and tickets, tickets, sales, and this this week, middle of this week, right. um, you know, if it stays where they're at, I mean, the, the senior prom will go away for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that one is definitely in jeopardy, and I'll just, there's a lot of bullet points here, and Mr. Stoutland has this, the board's interested in, you can forward it to them if you like. But the second last bullet point is probably um, the most pertinent that, okay, so some sign up for that, and we aren't able to run the Friday. We asked them if they want to go to Saturday. Now, 
seniors don't want to be with the juniors. I could have been But we would offer that. But here's the problem. In order to host a standalone Saturday event, the minimum would remain $15,000, not including the gratuity. And approximately 275 tickets will need to be sold to meet the cost for the night. So originally, we wanted a lower number. We're going to be, you know, uh, um, Mr. Borden, or Officer Borden is there. You know the venue. Uh, the dancing was going to be outside of the patio. We had a perfect plan set up for that. And so we were going to limit, you know, usually prompts 3 to 310. And we were going to limit that, so we would go higher to 275. Um, without a crystal ball, I don't know how we're going to meet that amount. And so um, we'll know more, but I just want to make the board aware that this is a very unfortunate thing. Um, a lot of work went into trying to, to do this for both classes. And um, it became out of our, our, our control in the sense that someone else went ahead and and wanted to do this. So I don't know if you all I, I'm extremely disappointed. I feel no. bad for the kids. I feel bad for the adults that have worked on this. Yep, no, and just to the point, we, we did speak to the venue and uh, let them know that this isn't, and I, that this isn't sponsored by us, and I've also sent a letter uh, that went out today to them so they're, so they're aware. Um, if it's okay, I would ask Mr. Stiles to forward you this. This is from our prom advisor. You'll see the details of it in here. Uh, in case you know it, it, it can become very quickly a, a PR nightmare because we had a plan in place and it's been ported unfortunately by um, personal choice. So, any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you for um, providing that clarity. When is the prom scheduled? What were the dates? The uh, seventh, May, May seventh and eighth. Yeah, seventh. So back, to, we're going back to back, and. I'll just add this, you know, the Greater Metro Conference meeting in February, uh, it was it was virtual. And I'll, I'll be honest, because, you know, it's, people know this, um, the conference principals knew that we would probably be the ones to look at doing prom. You know, and they're all kind of joking, please don't, because not that we're going to have to do it. It did open it up. And the same thing happened, um, I know the Grafton uh, principal from our time in the North Shore Conference, he called me and he said he had a similar experience in the North Shore meeting, like, you guys really gonna do this? You know, and, and he said, yeah, I mean, our community wants it, just like ours. So we conversed and they're actually doing the exact same thing um, next weekend, Friday and Saturday. So hopefully the weather will be fine for them, but they're doing the same type of format. Uh, I haven't connected with them recently, but we did work with them. They had some good ideas on how to do pod-related things with the tables. We had some ideas on how we had done things both at the River Club. So they're going to do that as well. So um, we thought we had a good plan in place. And we do have a good plan in place. Um, this was kind of an unforeseen type of thing. So, so if, if the parent group decides to do their thing, that's beyond our control, um, then I think we're forced to combine both into one. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and I don't know that we still would have enough what, 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 what is the gap? What, what is the gap? How much money are you looking for? Significant. Well, we don't I mean we don't know until the, yeah. they sell the tickets. But hey, Bob, can I make a suggestion? I mean, I've been involved with the proms for 14 years. I went. Mr. Farron and I were actual dates sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would make a I would make a suggestion that uh, Mr. Farron and Mr. Sells and keep us surprised of what's going on. And this board would do everything they can to get this to go on in place. And if we have to, we'll take the money out of contingency right. fund. And I don't care what the public says about that because a lot of this going into this is a lot of work and the behind the scenes. And for this not to happen because a selfish group out there chose to do something on their own is not fair to the rest of the kids. Yeah, and I, I agree 100%. Uh, we're like minded there. And um, you got kids have to have prom. And just like we had graduation, I think, again, we were forward thinking on that. We got it done. Uh, got it done successfully, and we could do the same for prom. And when do you need to know? When does your vendor need to know? Um, by, the, by the 20th, I, I believe think. believe the 20th. And we have one more board meeting? You, you have one on the 26th. No. Nope. No. Nope. But we'll. You have a board meeting on the 26th? 26th, we do, yeah. But you need to know beforehand. You need to know that. But the, the but advisor. We, we also the have 20th. in place, we also have in place that we, if it's under $10,000, they don't need, it doesn't need board right. approval. So. I'm just well, wondering though. Ticket sale ticket sales end on Friday. Yep. Um, you know, I I'll, he, he's been a part of the, the process because of how this has played out. So we can continue to update. Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, but what I'm what I'm getting at, and I think Mr. Ward will support this, um, because you need to know now. We you can't wait for the next board meeting. Right now, this is rather broad in terms of return to school discussion and action. We're we, we're going to be talking about masks coming up soon, but we could certainly entertain a motion for the prom. Kids need to have prom, and if it's possibly capped at a a dollar amount. Uh, it's not, we've got precedent for doing this with other groups uh, within the district. Why not for the prom? So. I have two, uh, two questions. So are we talking $10,000 and isn't there a class activity fund for every grade? And it, so if there is, why wouldn't we tap into then also supplementing with some of that senior class fund to offset since that was a decision that that class made? Um. You asked, I think, three questions in there. So, I yeah. answer. so yes, they fundraise. The major fundraiser starting freshman year is, is for the prom. Uh, if the senior one gets canceled on Friday, they'll lose their deposit of $2,000. Um, class funds do not have $10,000, $15,000 in them. They typically have enough to pay for prom, money for their senior banquet when they're seniors, and then they make a donation back to the school. So the amount, I don't know the exact amount of how much each class has in it, but it's not that. So the minimum on a, for a Friday night event is, is the 10,000. So seven, $75, you know, um, per couple, right? And so that was calculated to do that with, you know, with gratuity. And then the minimum for Saturday night event, because Saturdays, just like with weddings, are more expensive, is 15,000. So I can't, I can't look at this and say how much we're gonna need. You know, I, I can't, I can't, because we don't know how many of them sold. You know, if you're if you're at 20 kids that sign up for prom on Saturday, we're not going to have prom for 20 kids. So, um, I think some are waiting to see how this is going to play out. I'm not engaging with the parents that organized this. I just I'm choosing not to. I don't. I, I, I know the name of one. It was more, you know, came to us that way. But um, I think they have. They have to make a decision too, right? I think that was part of it, is what we were told later today. So um, I just wanted to make you aware that more, you know more work is being done. We're trying to do everything possible, but you know, Mr. Salzer wanted me to bring this up because it's really thrown the wrench in the plans of what we had for these students. So I don't know. You know, I, I'm not sure what motion, or if any. Well, you're, you're going to get you're going to get uh, clarity this week, right? Yep. Okay, um, would next week be too late? Because I would have no problem having a, a board meeting next week. Uh, too late for what? Well, like, no. I think what Mr. Borden was saying is that if it's if it's financial, it's under 15,000, it doesn't good. need to come to the board. So no, I think what I'm hearing yeah. is that we would keep monitoring it yep. and make some type of uh, common sense decision Perfect. on on the on the prom and again if it's 20 kids that's not a flood but if we're if we're good number of kids are, are attending then we'll make it happen okay and, and I'll just make a comment about the parents that are going down a different path and I don't want to judge them um, I mean we've been dealing with this for the last year and with all the sheltering in place um, remote working with your kids next to you, your spouse next to you, your dog barking. <laughs> a lot of things, a lot of interesting things happen. Uh, all you gotta do is look at social media. Uh, the outright hate that you see on social media that you see today, and the lying, the misinformation that is spread. Um, <laughs> I think we just need to be nice to each other, treat people the way we wanna be treated. Um, People want to wear masks, people don't want to wear masks. You see people wearing masks in cars. You see people wearing masks cutting the grass. Um, you know, when will that change? Summertime, who knows? You know, so a lot of things going on. There's a lot of stressors out there. And we all do things why we want to do them. And I just don't want to, it is what it is. You know, I, I don't want to judge the parents on that. I do have another question. So what would the cancellation be the fee for both canceling Friday and Saturday night? I think it's 2000 and 4000 right? 2000 definitely for Friday. It might be 2000 for each one. Because they, they, they've helped, they've, they've allowed us to, you know, we, 
we can't ask any more of them. They've been great. Mm -hmm. I understand. And they could they could have said we well, you know we're going to book a wedding you know and so they they've done that so I can I can get that information to Mr. Stiles on it. You know, Mr. Soderberg, to your point, I'm not I'm not asking to be judgmental. I'm just saying that the the problem is that this impacts over four hundred kids. And when it impacts kids, as a building principal, I understand. stand up for them. I understand. Well, and it, so that was my follow up to that. Then, if we're talking of either four thousand or six thousand for the cancellation fee, then for the students who had wanted to go and have a prom. Could we do something at the PAC where even if we just order in pizza and they put on tunes or do a movie or something, you know, so that those who truly wanted to attend a prom could still dress up and it's obviously not going to be the same, but still give them some experience. And we, you know, we, we haven't had those discussions, but that would be sort of the next step. We're still remaining hopeful. You know, I'm not ready okay. to give up hope yet. It's Monday. Yeah. until Friday. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping there's something we can do for them. Okay. It's just, we had, you know, the, the, the kids are on a prom committee. They, you know, they work with the advisors on this and um, we were excited about the plan. I didn't care, you know, that two nights in a row, we had to work from five to 11 o'clock at night, I didn't care. You know, I wanted to do this because, you know, they, they missed out on it. So um, it's just become, a lot more challenging in the last four days. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm confident that, uh, like you always done, you always put the kids first, and um, your team will come up with the right solution for the kids. So, thank you. Just want to make you aware. Any other questions? Thank you. Anything John. else on that? Nope. Uh, okay. So, a um, couple couple more things on this uh, report and one, the, there, there's these ESSER dollars, which is Elementary Secondary Emergency Relief Funding. Um, right as of now, um, we're expected to receive about 1.1 million so far. And, and I know uh, Ms. Altendorf has talked about it during her, um, the financial meetings. And there are restrictions on what you can use that, that money for. Um, the first round of ESSER dollars, we had about $75,000 that came in, and, and uh, because a certain percentage goes to the private schools, we ended up with about 71,000 of that money. The next round that has been um, publicized, and it hasn't have its official vote on it yet, but we should get um, roughly about 1.1 million um, that can support anything kind of COVID related. Uh, so that's, that's good news. Uh, for us. The, the second thing is, um, and my percentage is off after hearing Tammy's latest numbers of um, staff that has at least one shot. Um, we, do, we still are seeing positive cases, you've heard that. CD still, CDC is still recommending masks and as of today we've uh, been in school about seven and a half months, uh, which back in August I thought we'd be shut down in September and that, that didn't happen. Um, and there's literally 43 days of uh, school days. So we've, we've come a long way, and it's, uh, it's due to the support of our parents, the support of our staff and our, and our kids that uh, got us to this point. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, getting back to the, um, the dollars that we're anticipating to receive, the 1.1 million, um, there, and I'll send this link to the full board, um, but there, you, you can see that when you look at the schools involved, or all the schools in the, in the state of Wisconsin are, are getting some dollars, but um, when you look at um, schools like uh, Milwaukee Public Schools are getting $795 million, don't quote me on that. Uh, Racine, uh, Green Bay, Madison are in the multi-million dollars and you look at Germantown, that is five days in person, those schools, districts are not. Um, I've got a concern with that. So I asked uh, Mr. Stauslin a question last week. Should the board uh, draft a letter to DPI, I believe it's DPI, yep. um, uh, voicing our concern and asking the question why? 
why, what's the rationale or justification on how you could give a, almost $800 million to Milwaukee Public Schools when they didn't do in-person schooling and their kids are taking five, 10 steps back, whereas Germantown, we did in-person schooling, uh, which is the right thing for the kids. I want to know why. And I would just ask this board um, to um, authorize a letter uh, that all of us would sign and it would go to DPI. Are we okay with that? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. Great. I would support that, Bob, because you know what they, it, that equates to per student that Milwaukee was getting? Like $11,000 per student but to provide failing education. And I think for our district, that amounts to like maybe $123 a student. So uh, we delivered, and they didn't, and they're getting $11,000 a student. I agree, <laughs> which I'm, I'm concerned about. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I welcome 1.1 million. That's good news, but I just want to understand what, what's the why in, in the, the question. So, yeah, sounds okay. good. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we move on, uh, I would like to have a conversation relative to masks. There's been a lot of, um, uh, I guess, data out there. A lot of emails that came in on should we continue with masks? And Tammy did a wonderful job on your presentation. Uh, I get it. Um, but I also support the data too. The, the younger kids aren't getting sick. And if we've almost got 89% of staff that are inoculated, uh, when will it be the two shots? Will it be two weeks? Is it, will it be the full 89% two weeks from now or 30 days from now? When will that be? I, I don't know. I okay. have to look at when they receive their first shot. Okay. But, I, but based on the data that I have, most of them have more than the one shot they have to. They just didn't complete the second date in the data that I have. So that's my fault. I have to resend out the link for them to complete it so they can put in their second shot. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that it's a lot higher for those that have their second shot than just their first. Okay. Thank you. And I'm not saying that you know, we need to pivot at the high school or the middle school because I think that would be cause a lot of problems there. But I would like to have a discussion on the K through five and the elementary schools, um, maybe making it voluntarily, um, certainly within the classrooms, uh, when you're in the halls, wearing a mask on the bus, wearing a mask. And if I don't feel comfortable, I wear my mask. So, um, and if we don't want to have the conversation, that's fine. Um, but there's been a lot of, uh, Folks that don't want to wear masks, uh, the data supports that possibly you don't need to wear a mask. But I just like to have start a conversation on that. So. Well, I'll float a motion to get the conversation going. And it, Tammy, thank you for the information. Um, it, I, before the meeting, I was looking at the totality of the year and it, where elementary levels have been. And uh, so I would move that we approve making masks optional in the K through five classroom but still utilize it in the hallway and on the bus, effective May 3rd. That way it would allow staff the opportunity if they did not have their second vaccination, that they would have that. And it would be optional whether the students or the teacher would wear the mask within the classroom. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Discussion. I have some questions here. Do we still have in our elementary schools for gym, like the kids commingling in grades, or did we not do that? So like usually in gym class, you have two, two, two classes together being taught gym, right? So you have four, four grade class, no, four, fourth them, grade, they're, two they're and two. They're all by themselves. They're all by themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, my question to that is, what is the difference of not wearing masks in the classroom but wearing them at home in the hall when it's an airborne disease? Because if they're wearing them in the hall but they're not wearing them in the classroom, they're still putting it out in the air because they're not having their masks on. Well, I guess they were, they're in a more controlled environment within your classmates. Maybe that's me. I don't know. And if they, <laughs> but if they have their masks off in the classroom and they're putting them on, 
uh, before they're going out in the hallway, mm -hmm. then it, they aren't putting that out in the... I understand that there's a ventilation system, uh -huh. but even still, okay, they if masks theoretically work, mm -hmm. then uh, if they're wearing their masks in the hallway. Can I, can I comment? Yeah. yeah. You know, we, we just trained our K through five kids to learn to wear masks, and then now we're going to confuse them in the last 43 days to take it off. And then we have an airborne disease. We've changed the social distancing from six feet to three feet, and we just came off a of spring break. I think we're going down a disaster road. I, I, I think, you know, I would love to get, I hate wearing them. I absolutely hate wearing them. I would love to get rid of them, but I think right now for, we need to move forward for 43 more days until we get more of the people vaccinated um, before we move this route. I, that just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think we we're going to see numbers increase even more if we do this. You know, and then we're going to infect all these other people. I just, I just Ag don't. Agreed. I think that's a that's a step backwards where we're trying to move forward and we're trying to get more people vaccinated. I mean, research is, is now, the studies are out there. They're doing the trials for kids vaccinated for 12 and above. We're having very good promising that it's actually almost 100% effective versus like in adults, it's 94.5 and 95% effective. That in kids, it's actually showing 100% effective in that age group. We have a huge amount of kids in the high school that are currently getting vaccinated for 16 and above. My health aide there is already keeping track of that records. I just think that that's a huge step backwards. And like Ray was saying, we're going to start seeing a little bit of a spike. Yeah. Now, the thing with that is, is kids that do have it don't necessarily have severe infection. But again, that doesn't mean that they can't spread it. And it is airborne. So regardless if you have masks off in the classroom, but you have them on in the hallway, it's in the air regardless. That air moves, that circulation moves, that air is going in in the hallway. It, it doesn't matter. Either it's all or nothing. It, it's got to be in that classroom. Those kids are jam packed in there. They're breathing on each other. You know, they're doing all of those things. And a lot of the kids, why they get it, it's because their parents have it. Then the kids get it, and they don't even know. And then you're sending the kids to school that possibly have it, and then you're spreading it to all those other kids. I just think that's a huge step backwards. But we're not seeing the numbers, though. We're not because we do have the masks on. We're doing a really good job with that. You can see that the masks work. There's so much research out there that proves that they work. You, you, we gotta keep the masks on. The kids, like he was saying as well, we did so good in all year. We have 43 days left. Why stop now? I mean, these, these, <coughs> these little K-5 kiddos, that they do so good, so good. What, let's not change their routine. Let's keep it as is. It's a routine. These kids thrive on routine. Let's keep that going, and then let's revisit it before school starts next year. Because even our medical advisor, I had multiple conversations with him, hopefully by July. July is what hopefully we're looking at. More and more people are going to be vaccinated. Kids, hopefully by 12 and above, maybe then by that time, you're going to start doing uh, trials with kids under 12. And maybe even by, by fall, we will have kids under 12 vaccinated. And we won't need them at all for anywhere. Uh, yeah. um, Mr. Stelson, do you have a sense from the schools of how the teachers would respond if we took away masks? I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing we're having trouble filling some of our substitute positions. I wonder if that would get even worse if we didn't have masks at elementary level. I mean, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I, I don't think they'd be very happy. I can um, tell you they're not going to be happy. And, um, you know, for some, that was the knowing that we were supporting the mass all year is what kept them coming to work. Um, I, I guess the other piece is that we don't have data from parents saying, "I don't want my kid to wear a mask." I don't. I'm not. We have. I've had two people reach out um, that don't want their kids to wear a mask, and that's the same people that have reached out all year since September, where I've had more people, especially when the governor's. Um, mandate was being lifted I had a lot more people reach out worried about that we would um, you know that we would lift lift our our guidelines on that and um, I, I just I don't I don't see the reason to remove them at this at this point and um, you know I, especially at the elementary our, our teachers are very good about giving the kids mask breaks when they need them mm -hmm. they're outside on recess they don't they don't need to wear them so they it's not like they're on their face all day 
obviously when they have snack, um, it's often lunch. So um, again, I, I just am not, we're not getting a push from anywhere to remove the masks um, outside of, a, of two people. So. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails, a lot of calls. Um, and again, I, I'm a firm believer in following the science, the data. Uh, and I would agree with Mr. Borden, you know, 43 days left, why pivot now? Yep. But I, I'll get back to the conversation that we had, if not now, when? And you said summer. I said, okay, yep. why is summer, why is that the magical time? You because know? again, we're gonna have a higher percent that are vaccinated. The more the vaccinated people we have, the less the spread, the less infection, the more we can get rid of all these mitigation measures. And we're actually further in our vaccination process in the country than I thought we would be, to be honest with you. I did not think we were gonna be this far, so that is huge. And Wisconsin, we are number one in the state for how we distribute our vaccines, or number one in the country, excuse me, for how we distribute our vaccines and how quickly we get our vaccines and getting them in the arms of people. So we are doing fantastic. I just ask, give us those last 43 days. Let's keep going as we are. Let's get past this. At the end of the year, let's throw them in the garbage and move on and be ready for fall. <laughs> I know there's been a handful of school districts in the state that have pivoted already. Yeah. And uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens in those districts. Mm -hmm. Brian? Yeah, I'm willing to wait the 43 days. I have no interest in taking away the mask at this point. I think we can hold out. At least that gives us the opportunity that anybody who wants to be vaccinated by the end of summer, you'll have the opportunity to be vaccinated. And then you can open the floodgates as far as I'm yep. concerned. But let's get to that point first. Mike? May 3rd is not 43 days. I don't know what the number of days is, but it's not 43. So well, it's, it's 43 to the end of the school years. Right, right. school. That's right. when school's out. From May 3rd? No, from now. No. From today. From now. Today. Yeah, from today. So it's not 43 days. It's 43 school days. 40, 33 school days. days. It's 25. I don't know. I haven't looked at the calendar, but it's not 43 days. The other thing, Tammy, you said uh, that a parent could have COVID and then send their student to school with it. Wouldn't, aren't the parents uh, quarantining their children when they get it themselves so and they're not sending? So what happens a lot of times is it, take, it takes quite a few days to get to that point to even know that COVID's there. So your most infectious time frame is 48 hours before symptoms even start. So that's your most infectious time frame. So if you have a parent who starts developing symptoms on a Friday, their most infectious time is Wednesday and Thursday. So in the most, spread is within their own household. So those kiddos have been really exposed to those parents that whole time, and especially those 48 hours before the parents even started symptoms. So say the parents didn't even start symptoms till Friday night, those kids were exposed Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Par parents started to get sick on Friday, then they developed like really deep symptoms on Saturday, couldn't get in, got tested on Sunday, still didn't know they had COVID, Kids are still okay at this point because again, from the time of exposure, it takes six to seven days to actually develop symptoms to know that you have an infection. Those kids probably went to school on Monday because parent probably could have thought, I just have a cold or it could be just an allergies or whatever. Well, now the parent got their test results Monday or even Tuesday when symptoms started last week Friday and they were most infectious last week Wednesday or Thursday. So those kids were in school for almost a full week while they were exposed. So that's where that all comes from and how that works. So that's why those kids are still in school, could be developing the infection, nobody has a clue, and then could possibly start develop symptoms themselves Thursday and Friday, because that's been about a week since their exposure. In that time frame, they were in school, exposed everyone else on that Tuesday, Wednesday, when they were most infectious and nobody even knew. Okay. Again, this is great discussion and you can't have discussion without a motion on the table. So, uh, Amanda. I'm willing to pull it back if you'd like. No, not yet. I'm, 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 I, wanna, I, I wanna hear from all the board members because there's a lot of uh, passion associated with this. I, you know, he, he, you know I, I, I don't wanna wear a mask, but uh, I, I do it. I don't try to judge people. I'm very respectful of that. Um, but, you know, and I applaud these school districts for going down this path. Uh, and I think more and more school districts that do that, 
I think you're going to see a paradigm shift in our, in our, our state, in our nation. Uh, not unlike what you're seeing in return to, return to work in, in the business world. Um, it just takes that one person to go the next step. And so I, I, I'm not going to criticize for those school districts for going down that path. But I, I welcome the conversation here. I welcome everyone's opinion. It's uh, I, Mr. Board, 43 days. I, I get it. I understand. Amanda. I feel the same way. I mean, we are so close to the end right now. Would the kids like to get rid of it? Yes. Would I like to get rid of it? Yes. But quite frankly, it's working. Let's just finish the school year out where everybody's healthy. And if we're truly up here for the kids, then that's what our job is to do. Make sure they are safe and healthy in the classroom so they can enjoy their summer. Great. Mr. Barney. Yeah, well, we, need to get, we need to get them to the end of the year. Yes. I mean, we're, we're right there. Um, and if keeping the mask on is the way to do it, you know, I don't like it either, but I think that's the best way to keep them in the class. Um, and, and to those districts that may have removed the mask mandate, I think a lot of those did so because they were specifically linked to the state mandate. So once the state mandate went away, so did their school mandate. For us, it's been based on risk mitigation and CDC recommendations. Mm -hmm. That's why we still have it. And, and along with that, I mean, what are their class sizes? What are their school sizes, right? Are those small rural areas? And, and we have large class, right. large schools. We have a lot of kids in one building. So we have to keep all of those kids and staff safe. Yep. Michael? Yeah, again, it's not 43 days, but um, <laughs> you, you, you know, we're discussing this with an engineer, you know, who knows math, so it's not 43 days, but um, an, a, another item is, is it takes a second to truly discuss the issue. You know, it's not just a first, it's a second, otherwise it dies. So that's why I made the second. Understood. Um, and, and I believe the motion was for optional. So my understanding is, <clears throat> is in the schools where uh, it's optional. Many of the students are still wearing the masks. So I think uh, most students probably would wear them, K through five, and, and there would be just a handful of students, which of course we couldn't control, uh, but there would be just a handful of students that would not wear them, let's say those that just can't take it. Uh, so I don't know, that's, that's all I have. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the motion was for K through five. And it, it doesn't appear that there's appetite to uh, relax the mask uh, requirement. So, Mrs. Larson? I'm happy to rescind it. There you go. All right. Again, thank you for the conversation. Uh, I think we needed to have this conversation for the benefits of uh, staff, uh, our students, and our parents, so that uh, everyone knows where we are at in terms of at least for the next 43 days of the school year. So. I sure hope that, you know, in you know, the summertime, that's where a lot of the work gets yeah. done. Uh, yeah. You know what's going to happen when we have these conversations. Well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So oh, let's, hope we, let's there. hope we are there. <laughs> let's hope we're there. <laughs> so, but again, Tammy, thank you so much uh, for, for, for presenting eloquently like that. You are a true professional. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Mr. Stauslin, anything else on return to school? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm positive. <laughs> okay. Next topic. All right. Uh, item B, discussion and action to approve donations. Mr. Stausen. Yes, I'd ask the board to approve the donation of $200 from Abigail and Scott Schmitz to the High School Environmental Club. Entertain a motion. So moved. <clears throat> Do I have second. A second. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Yes. Yes. Discussion. Yes, sir. Um, it was the environmental club presented at uh, County Line School, and they did ask for uh, donations at that time. And um, part of what they presented that evening was uh, re-roofing uh, using students to do the work. So they were buying the building materials, and, and uh, Mr. Stahoyak and students were going to do the work. So this is really the best type of education uh, Th there is, you know, hands-on work. So that really, there's a question though I have. It's been a long time since I donated to the school system, other than, you know, serving on the school board. Um, how does I see Abigail and Scott Schmitz have stepped up? Possibly they have a student in the environmental club. How 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 does a citizen donate? 
uh, in this case, $200 to the environmental club? Yep, good question. So really, we'll take anybody's money any way. Um, <laughs> right. So if they, if, if they you know, reach out to the, the specific teacher, they could donate, or they could um, get, a, get, get a hold of myself or Jane in the district office and say we'd like to, to make a donation to this group, and then they, they bring in a check, and then we, we bring it to the board. If it's over uh, $200, it's, um, it's brought to the board for approval. So, so they need to come in or just mail it in? They can mail it in. They can call the, the, that they're sending it, um, or they could just send it with a note, and we will make sure it gets to the right location. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. Good question. Further discussion? Saying none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Uh, item 10, closed session. The Board of Education will entertain a motion to convene in closed session, pursuant to sections 1985-1, F to discuss a student issue. Entertain a motion. I move we go into closed session for the reasons stated. Second. Uh, discussion, no discussion. Roll call, please. Medved. Yes. Loth. Yes. Borden. Yes. Myself, yes. Reinemann. Yes. Larson. Yes. Soderberg. Yes. We're in closed session at 9.01, and thank you everyone for coming, and have a wonderful evening, and be safe.